All is well. Yeah, my notebook turned the right way it would be. Celebrating Christmas season. Last week we talked about how to de-stress during the holidays by keeping it all about Jesus. And pretty much the message today is just all about Jesus. Amen? Because that's the heart of uh, who we are and what we believe. If it's not about Jesus, then you're just missing the mark completely. And we're going to see that as we talk about the message today. You know, we know the Christmas story well. We uh, think of the shepherds in the field where the angels appear and they're singing glory to God in the highest. And they, they give the message to the shepherds about the baby being born in Bethlehem. And they run to the place where Jesus lay in the manger. The Bible says in Luke 2, it says that when they return after being there, they returned praising God and glorifying God for all the things that they had seen as it was told to them. Now, we know what was told them in a brief sentence there that the angels tell them about Jesus, the Messiah, but we, don't, we aren't told everything that they saw when they got there. It was just said they saw something, amen, and they saw some glorious things, so much so that it blew their minds. They returned glorifying God. They're praising God. I mean, when you, when you get those two words together, they're glorifying and praising, you know they're having a, what Bill Stever used to call it, a spell. They, they're praising the Lord for all the things they've heard and all the things they've seen. It was uh, William Chatterton Dix, who 150 years ago, probably more than that now, who penned the words of that classic hymn, What Child Is This? You're probably familiar with that, the lyrics, What Child Is This, who, who's laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping. Of course, they answer the question to what child is this with the next por portion of the verse where it says, this, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing, haste, Haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. Talk about what child is this, is the shepherds beheld the glory of God. As Mary and Joseph are there, as the wise men eventually make their way there, they all be be behold pretty much the same thing, the same one. And that one is Jesus. And I've titled this message today, Majesty in a Manger. And I want to look in Hebrews chapter 1 this morning. And as we walk through Hebrews chapter 1, maybe your eyes will be opened a little bit more to how much majesty was in that manger that night. How much glory was revealed and how much of God's presence was manifest in that little stable area. Most likely a little hewn out place in the rocks, a cave, because that was pretty much the surroundings of Bethlehem. Most of the shepherds kept their, their flocks in caves that were all splattered throughout the, that rocky territory. But they come and they behold the, the, the Lamb of God. They behold the Lord of glory. And in Hebrews chapter 1, we'll look at verses 1 through 4. It makes this statement. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he inherited a more excellent name than they. It's a great passage that tells us a little bit more, a little in depth about that baby that lay in the manger that Christmas morning. But just who is this child? What's the story behind the story? Well, it starts out here in this passage, and there's about six or seven things I want to share with you today if the Lord gives us time. But to start with point one from this is the baby in the manger, the little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. He, that little child, is the heir of all things. He's both the son of Mary, understand, and he's also the son of God. He had no human father, conceived by the Holy Spirit in the, moon, in the womb of Mary. This little baby born in Bethlehem is ultimately the heir of everything that is and everything that's been created. The Bible says he's heir of all things. Why? Pretty simply, God owns all things. Therefore, Jesus is the heir of all things. If I leave my family, uh, an inheritance, they become heirs of what I've left behind. If I leave behind a little, they heirs of a little. If I leave a lot, they're heirs of a lot. If I leave nothing, they're heirs of nothing. But understand that God, the eternal Father, has made Jesus the heir of all things. He owns all things. All things are his. Psalms 2 is a, is a bit of a prophetic psalm. And it says this, and he's speaking about the second, the return of the Lord Jesus. He said, I have set my king 
On my holy hill of Zion, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a, a potter's vessel. Now that's a prophetic. Hundreds of years before Christ is even born. It's talking about the second coming when Jesus comes to reign on the throne of Jerusalem, on the throne of David as the King of kings and the Lord of lords over all things. This is prophetic, speaking much, much, many years before the birth. Psalms 89 is also a prophetic psalm. And it's the father speaking of Jesus. He says, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of kings of the earth. Now, firstborn, when it's talking about it, it doesn't mean that Christ is not eternal, that he was just born at this time. We know if we studied uh, Christology and understand Jesus and who he is in eternity, that he was before all things, that he's been from everlasting to everlasting. He's the alpha, he's the omega. This is when he becomes to us in human form. So it means here that he's the firstborn, not that he's not eternal, but it speaks of his legal right his legal place as the son of God to inherit all things. Colossians makes a statement this way. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. All things belong to that little baby born in the manger. Everything was created for him. When Jesus came to the earth, born of a virgin, he willingly divested himself, not of his glory, it was in clothes, but of all that, that heavenly glory. Now just think for a moment. He enters into this world, lives those first days, weeks, and months in a stable, takes a position of poverty and humility on the planet, it was intentional. He chose to live this way. The Bible says he became poor so that you and I might be made rich. The richness of God's blessing is the fact that we have a treasure that God's given to us. And what is that treasure? That treasure is possessed by every person who claims Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. If you know Jesus personally, you had this treasure, as the apostle said, treasure in earthen vessels. In your body dwells the very presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, he is the creator of all things. All things are created for him. It's interesting in Luke where it says, you know, that the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. That was intentional because there was no, this was not his mission to build himself a nice home and a nice place with a nice retirement and then take off. He came for one purpose, he was born for the purpose, we'll talk about in a moment, where it talks about being the purger of our sins. And when Jesus does return to the second, the second advent, the second coming, he's not coming again as a baby, born in kind of destitute situation. He's coming as the Lord of glory. He's coming as the King of kings. He's coming as, Hebrews says, the heir of all things. And mark this down, when he comes like this, he's coming to take possession of all things. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, here's, the, here's what even gets better about this. Because we are children of God, because we have committed our lives to Christ, the Bible makes it clear that we, as believers, children of God, brothers and sisters of Christ Jesus, that we also, with him, will be heirs of all things. This is the way Romans 8 puts it, in verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, if we're children of God, guess what? Then we're heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, we'll be glorified together with him. We are joint heirs with Christ. That's the, that's the beauty of Christ's coming was to, to involve us, to, to, to bring us into his family. And being members of the family, oh, folks, we're in the will. <laughs> we're, we're a part of the covenant relationship. We, as he, become heir of all things. And he's the Lord of all things. Now, the second thing I want you to see, and this all ties in from part, each portion of scripture. Verse two says that it was through whom, Jesus also, that the father made the world. In other words, the baby lying in the manger is the very one who created all things. The reason all things exist are because of him. 
Now, this is amazing. When you start talking about creation, we could go on a long time, but let me just, let me just kind of move it in a little different direction. The Bible makes it clear that all of us are created in the very image of God. I mean, God created us in his own image. The Bible makes it clear to us. Now, to, uh, to understand that fully, we probably won't until we stand with Jesus one day in glory. But there's, God put in us that which represented himself in so many different levels. Now, God is creator of all things. And God gave every, I believe, every one of us on some to some degree, this creative passion, this, this creative desire, whether it's creating music, creating sculpture, creating art, creating you know, uh, architecture. I mean, there's just so many ways that people like to express creativity. I mean, just look at all the great works of art all around the world, all around us that we see all the time. If you doubt that men are naturally creative, just visit any elementary school uh, art exhibit, amen? And there's just something about every child. We want, to, we want to build something. We want to make something. We want to do something. We want to create something. And it's all around us. But this is the very nature of God is this creative thing. And God has given that same desire, that drive to us. When you think about all these great works of literature, all the great creativity of art, all the great creativity of, as we said, architecture, all the things that are involved with, with, with putting something together. Someone's mind designed all those things. But behind all those things, God gave us that creative mind to do that and that creative ability to do it. But there's one thing that distinguishes our creativity from God's creativity. You say, what is it? God creates from nothing. You took something. You took raw materials. You took paint. You took plaster. You took steel. You took iron. You took things and you created something from something. But here's the omnipotence of God. Here's that powerful, majestic Lord Jesus Christ who comes and creates from nothing. And John 1 says, all things were made by him. And without him, without him, not anything was made. Nothing was made that was made. He created all things. They were all made through him. And without him, they weren't made. We read from Colossians a while ago. It says, all things were created through him as well as for him. First Corinthians eight says, yet for us there is one God, the father of whom are all things and we for him and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we live. So what is it saying here? This baby, the Lord Jesus Christ is the creator of everything that we see. You know, it's in, in our text says that Jesus made the worlds. Now, a lot of times we think of the world, typically speaking about the earth or, you know, the planets. But literally, this is the word for, we get our word cosmos from. All that is, all that's out there, everything was, was made by him. There's another word that's used when it talks about his creation. And it talks about, in, in fact, the, the Hebrew, in Colossians is talking about how he made the worlds. In Hebrews, it's talking about another word of creativity. It says that he created, and the word there is the aeons or the eons or the ages. In other words, that Jesus not only created the physical world we see, the physical realm that we see, but he also created time and space and energy and matter. He made everything from nothing. He made everything from nothing. But, you know, we still have our ludicrous so-called scientists who try to teach our children that one day the world simply began that once there was nothing, and then all of a sudden there was something, and it really just, that nothing came, that something came from nothing, and deny God. Logic dictates that what comes from nothing is nothing. <laughs> nothing produces nothing. Only somebody blind, deluded faith would enable them to somehow to believe that the complexity of all creation, all that we see around us, simply evolved from nothing. If there were ever nothing, there would still be nothing until God enters to the scene and he makes everything so that everything can be made and sustained. And as you follow this through, it talks about how he, he created, that he's the heir of all things. And obviously he's, he's the heir because they belong to him. He created them, right? Which means that you also belong to him. Now, if you're resisting that, you're just wasting your time. It's a futile way to live your life. The third point he brings out here, verse three, he says that the baby in the manger is, use this term, the brightness of God's glory. Verse three says that Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory. Now, brightness here comes from, from a Greek word that means to send 
forth light. He's, he is the, the light that's manifest from God's glorious glory. The NAS, the NIV, the NRSV, they all translate the radiance of God's glory. He is the reflection of God's glory. All through the scriptures. In fact, he said here in the beginning of Hebrews, he says, in old times, before Christ, in old times, he spoke to us through his word, through the prophets, through, through messengers. And we saw through those messengers and through those prophets, we see just a little bit of the brightness of the glory of God, just a little inkling of the glory of God. In fact, you go back into to the book of, uh, uh, of Exodus and you see Moses there as he's on the mountain conversing with God and request to see the glory of the Father. You remember how God told him that he couldn't live through it. So he hid him in the cleft of the rock. And as God passed by, all that Moses beheld was that trailing parts. The latter parts, like a glorious bridal you know, uh, veil and flowing veil of, of glory of God as it goes by. In fact, it impacted him physically so much. It physically impacted him. The Bible says that when he came down off the mountain, the people couldn't even look at Moses because of that remaining abiding residual glory of God on him physically. That he had to cover his face. He had to cover his face. And you see little bits and pieces in times past, as it says in verse one, in various times and in various ways. There's a quick glimpse of the glory of God when you see the people of Israel on Mount Sinai, there's flashes of lightning and thunder and glory. You see as the children of Israel enter into the, to the wilderness and the tabernacle is erected and God leads the children of Israel the, as they carry the tabernacle through the wilderness. He leads them with a fire by day and a cloud, uh, a fire by night and a cloud by day. And remember, if we were taught on the tabernacle, on all those things that represented, that was the glory of God being manifest. And as they followed the glory of God, it was that fire by day that gave them, the fire by night that gave them light and a cloud by day. And that's just a little bit of his, what the Hebrew is Shekinah, the Shekinah we say in Texas, amen? The Shekinah glory of God. And you see it as it trails them. Isaiah the prophet gets a little glimpse of the glory of God in Isaiah chapter six, when he said, you know, I, I saw the Lord and I, this train or his glory filled the temple and the seraphim and the angels were covering their hands and their face and their feet and they were singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. They were worshiping and praising God and his glory was being manifest. How did Isaiah respond? He fell on his face. He's broken by the brightness, by the beauty, by the glory of God. And he says, woe is me for I'm a man of unclean, I'm a sinner, I'm, I'm unholy, I'm unclean. That's what usually happens when the brightness of God's glory manifests itself into our heart. But we see this little glimpse of this in the Old Testament. And then I think the first little glimpse we see in the New Testament, we taught on this a couple of years ago about the wise men that came looking for Jesus as they, he says, we followed his star. Well, the word star there and for like a planet and star or something like that, it's, it means a shining light. I believe what they were following is the glory of God that led them to the promised land, that led them to Israel, and eventually it led them to that, to that manger scene where they meet and see little baby Jesus in the manger. So you see little glimpses of the glory of God, but now, as you've seen all that glory and all that majesty that's being manifest, Hebrews says, now we're looking at this baby in the manger and he is the brightness of the Father's glory. For John 1, 14, it speaks prophetically of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there it says, and the word became flesh and the dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. When we put our faith in Jesus, when we trust him as our Lord and Savior, you know what happens? It's that treasure I was talking about earlier. That glory of God is placed and bound up within our hearts. You know what worship is? Worship is just letting that glory of God out in adoration and praise and love to God. In Psalms and Proverbs, it talks about that, that the high praises of God be in our mouth. I believe that's when the glory of God is just coming out of his, his, his people's hearts and their lives as they worship him. In John 8, it says, there's a passage also where Jesus is speaking. Where he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. What is the light of life? It's the glory of God that shines in our heart. 
how sad is it? How tragic is it that we come and we celebrate Christmas not realizing that it is the salvation of the world that's being presented to us. That it's the answer from the ages about the darkness that men have lived in and walked in and the sin that has plagued their life. It is a message of hope like light being poured into darkness. It says we can be rescued. We can be delivered. We can be saved. Second Corinthians four says we don't respond that way. The Bible says that the, that the, the God of this world, the, that he blinds the, the minds of those who, who would not believe. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Who is the image of God? It's Jesus. He is also the glory of God. It is his light that should shine on our hearts. And John, Jesus tells us and it speaks of Jesus. He said, you know, but men love darkness rather than light. What happens? People don't want light. Jesus said to his disciples, you know, they hated me. Why? He said, because I came to reprove the world of their sin. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll do the same thing. He'll be light. And, and people don't want their sin exposed to them. We're living, especially in that particular generation, in that particular age, which is recognized in Scripture as the end of ages. And at the end of ages, specifically, it says people do not want light. They want their ears tickled. They want to assemble together. They want to be called the church, but they don't want the truth. They want to hear soft and palatable messages that, that just kind of soothe their conscience, not expose themselves to themselves. It's only when we come to light that we have life. It's only when we run to the light that we discover really ourselves. And we see ourselves, and we see our sin and we see our own personal depra depravity like, like Isaiah when he said, woe is me. But it's in coming to the light. Well, first John, you follow that first chapter. He says, you know, th th there's the light and Jesus is the light of the world. He said, but you know, there's darkness also. He says, you know, if you say you walk in light, but you do not the truth, he said, you're walking in darkness. He said, but if we walk in the light, which is Jesus, if we walk in the light, we can have fellowship one with another. And the next verse is, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Now, why does he put that there? He puts that there because when we walk in the light, we're going to see our sin like Isaiah. And we don't run from it. I don't want to see that. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to deal with that. I don't, no, we run to it and say, Lord God, deliver me. Set me free. Wash me. Save me. Make me righteous and make me whole. We see the majesty in the manger is the holy light of God that shines into the world and brings hope and life. Now, here's another thing to catch this. And this is important as you stu study Christology. In, in Christology, you see that Jesus, the baby in the manger, is the very image of the Father. It says that in verse 3. He is the express image of his person. So not only is Jesus the brightness and the glory of God, he is God. He is the physical manifestation of the eternal, holy, almighty God. So that when people look to Jesus, they see the Lord God. The Bible, we understand, that teaches us that there's a trinity, that the God is a trinity, but they're inseparable in reality. What did Jesus say to, to Philip? He said, if any man has seen the Father, and if any man wants to see the Father, if he's seen me, he's seen the Father. The phrase, when it talks about here being the express image, comes from a term used to describe an impression that was made by, by a seal or by a stamp. All right. And this seal of the stamp was often done with, with like a wax signature. And that, that stamp uh, would be laid upon a piece of wax. If a, if a document was sent and it was an official document, authentic, the real deal, the real thing, so that you could trust whatever the decree or declaration might be in that document, those in authority would put that big drop of wax on it and take their ring off and put their signet ring inside the wax to seal that document. Now, this is kind of what the word when it talks about the express image. It's the idea uh, of the stamp ring ensuring a document's official. In fact, that practice still carries over today. We have people in our church we call notaries, all right, notary publics. What do they do? They witness, they verify that whatever's represented in a document is the real deal, that those who sign it are really who they say they are. It ensures authenticity. Jesus is the one. If you want to know the authenticity of God, look to Jesus Christ. He is the express image. He is the seal of the Father. He bears that upon his life. Martin Luther said that Jesus is God deep in the flesh. Everything about Jesus reflects the Father. Colossians 1 gives us this passage when it says, and it's a similar statement. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
Now, image here is a different word from that word icon, uh, which we get the word icon, econ from we get a word icon. It means he is a precise copy. He's an exact duplicate. What you see here is what he is there. I mean, he, he, the closest I think we can even come to it in our cultural understanding would be something like a photograph. Jesus is the photograph of the Father. You want to see what the Father looks like? Look to Jesus. The Son, according to Hebrews 1, he reflects the brightness of his glory. He is the express image of God. He shows us exactly what our Heavenly Father is and who he is and what he's really like. The Son reflects the glory. He is the physical, according to Colossians 2, 9, he is the physical expression. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus himself, as I quoted a while ago, who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, this is taken in John 14 about a passage that's shared a lot of times at funerals. When it says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am you may be also. And Philip stands at this point where the disciples said, well, Lord, we don't know the way. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Philip said, well, show us the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. Hallelujah. That's who we serve. That's who saves us. So when Mary gives birth to this little baby, all right, she wasn't the first sight those little eyes had ever seen. We believe that Christ is eternal. The Old Testament reveals Jesus to us in a lot of different ways, different characters. I believe when Joshua is standing at the, and overlooking Jericho, it's the Lord Jesus who shows up, the man with the sword in his hand. And Joshua recognizes the glory of God and, and takes his shoes off and humbles himself before him and, and worships him. Sometimes we see angelic visitors and they not, do not allow men to worship. But every time you see some kind of heavenly visitor in the Old Testament and they allow themselves to be worshiped, that's a Jesus. It's what you call you know, Christology of the Old Testament, theophany and Christophany, the visible images of God. But now Jesus appears in little, tiny, human form. And he looks upon an earth that he's created. Now catch this, the fifth, the fifth thing here is this baby is the, in the manger is the upholder of all things. The next verse, verse 3, says that he upholds all things by the word of his power. You know what that means? That means that Jesus Christ is the sustaining force of all creation all the time. He not only made all things, he not only will inherit all things, he is right now the sustaining and upholding power that holds all things together. In fact, this word upholding means to support and maintain. It's used here in the present tense that Jesus is right now and continually upholding all things. That right now he's holding everything together. In fact, if he wasn't, that chair you're sitting in would fall apart. It's not the great engineering that holds it together. The engineer would be nowhere without the creator. Everything is held together by his great grace. The Bible says by the word, his, his powerful words. Colossians 1:17 says, he is before all things. He's before all things and in him all things consist. I think I got past my notes there, got ahead of myself. But let me just read you this quote. I, I read him in one of MacArthur's commentaries. And he wrote this down, he says, consider what instant destruction would happen if the earth rotation slowed down for just a little. The sun has a surface temperature of over 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot, right? That's hotter than Houston in August. If it were any closer to us, we'd burn up. If we were any further away, we would freeze. Our globe, our world is tilted on its axis at exactly 23 degrees. It provides us with the four seasons that we experience. If it were not so tilted, Vapors from the ocean would move north and south and develop into monstrous continents of ice. The moon, if it did not retain its place in the space in heaven and didn't retain its exact distance from the earth, the ocean tides would inundate the land at least twice a day. If the ocean floors were merely a few feet deeper, this is the floor of the ocean, if it were only a few feet deeper, then they are, then carbon dioxide, an oxygen balance of the Earth's atmosphere would be completely upset and no animal life nor any plant life could exist. How does the universe stay in this kind of fantastically delicate, beautiful balance that it's in with all its movements and all its inner working? How does that happen? Christ 
the preeminent power, maintains all things. The baby born in Bethlehem is the upholder, Hebrew says, of all things, and they all are held together by him. And by the way, just as a little side thought here, if he can hold everything in creation together, don't you think he can hold your life together? Don't you think he can support you? In fact, Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, you should be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You can trust him with your life. If he can hold creation, all the intricacies of creation together, and certainly he can uphold you and he can uphold me if I'll put my faith in him. The last point is the baby in the manger is the purger of our sins. Now this is, this is you think about all those points I've just shared with you about all his deity, all his majesty, and all his power. How wonderful that we have a Savior that created the world, sustains everything by his power, but greater news than that is he's taken care of our greatest need, and that's to be set free from our sins. He is the purger of our sins. In the Old Testament, the, the sacrifices would be made continually, the Scripture tells us. Why would, the, why would the priest be making sacrifice continually? Because people were continually sinning. The Old Testament picture of the, of the purging or washing away of sins is just that. It's an Old Testament picture of a high priest who would one day, the high, real high priest would come and wash away our sins once and for all. And the baby that was born in Bethlehem is the same one who became the perfect once for all sacrifice for our sins. The lamb slain from before the foundations of the world. Have you ever given much thought to that scripture? The lamb slain before the foundation. How could he be slain before the foundations of the world? Because we know he was slain, you know, in a certain period of time in history, in, in time and space, on a cross in Golgotha. That's when he was slain. How could he be slain before the foundations? In the mind of God, in the will of God, and the plan of God was that he, knowing man would fail in sin, he also devised a means and a mechanism and a way, a savior, a deliverer to rescue us from those sins. Long before man ever sinned, I believe before man was ever created, before the foundations of the world were set, this plan had been set in place. First Peter 1 says, We are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from our aimless conduct received from the traditions of our fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. Hebrews 9, 6 says, But now, now once, and catch this, once at the end of the ages, it's where we are. He has appeared to put away sin. How? By the sacrifice of himself. Our text says he himself purged our sins. He did it. No one paid for our sins but Jesus. And no one helped Jesus pay for our sins. No one hung on the cross with him. No one went through Gethsemane with him. No one helped Jesus in this, in, in this endeavor. Even the father turns his back at that point when Jesus becomes the ultimate sacrifice and he becomes, as, as Paul wrote, he who knew no sin becomes our sins. In that moment, all alone he hung, suspended between heaven and earth is the ultimate sacrifice. He bore all your sins, all my sins, the entire sins of the world and universe were laid upon his shoulder. Bottom line is this, the baby born in a manger in Bethlehem was born to purge our sins, to take away our sins, and to die for us. He paid the ultimate price. The baby born, this is the last point, in a manger is the completer of our salvation. Not only does he die, pay the price for our sins. You don't need to skip over this last statement, in verse 3, where it says, after doing this, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. It, it represents completion. And he sits at the right hand. That doesn't mean that Jesus is just God's right hand man, all right? But it means even more than that. It, it means that Jesus represents and symbolizes all the authority and all the power of God. If you go in back to the Old Testament and you look in the temple, there's no seat but the mercy seat, and it's not that kind of seat. I don't think any high priest is going to go sit on the mercy seat. Why were there no seats in the temple? Because the priest never sat down. They're always working, making sacrifices because sin never ceased. And none of the sacrifices were sufficient. They weren't really complete. They only represented the complete sacrifice that would come. The most important words here is that he sat down, representing a completed work. He declared in John 19 on the cross, it is finished. The work is done. He's completed the work of your salvation by making what? That perfect 
eternal, lasting sacrifice for our sins at the cross. He said it, it's finished, it's paid for. How sad that so many people try to live their lives, somehow try and think they're gonna satisfy God and get good enough to be good enough to get into heaven. And in their mind, they really think that works that way because there's always somebody that's worse than they are. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so and I'm not drunkard and I'm not, you know, and I'm not an adulterer and I'm not a robber and I'm not killing anybody. You know, there's nowhere in the Bible that says, you know, all you non-killers come to heaven. All you non-bank robbers get to come to heaven. The Bible makes it clear it's not of works lest any man would boast. If it's about me working for salvation and it's about me somehow being the, having the capacity to say, well, look what I did. No, we say, look what he did. Look what's been accomplished for us. Look what Christ did. Look what God did. He sat down at the right hand in full completion. Romans 8, 34 gives this passage as he even is at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Does he just never stop giving? No. Does he never stop, this never stops caring? This is a beautiful thing. If I come to Christ and I surrender my heart and life to him, he purges my sin, but then he commits himself to me that he began a good work in me, will per perform it. Because now he has all authority and all power to make it happen. So my salvation doesn't rest in what I did and it's not kept by what I keep doing. My salvation rests in the fact that it's all been paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I think we listen to a little bit what Hebrews said, then we get a little bit more insight to what they actually saw that night in the manger when the shepherds went away, praising and glorifying God for all that they'd seen and all that they heard. Why? Because he is the heir of all things. Because he is the creator of all things because he is the brightness of God's glory, because he is the exact image of the Father, because he is the upholder of all things, and he's the purger of our sins, and he's the completer of our salvation. He is majesty in a manger. <laughs> International evangelist by the name of Louis Palau told the story of a wealthy European family that threw a party for their newborn baby in this enormous mansion and everybody's invited to come see the new child and dozens of guests were invited and it was a big elaborate affair. Everybody's dressed in the formals and to the nines as we say. They would come in, they'd deposit their, their wraps and their furs and their coats in an in a upstairs bedroom as they would all come in, those coats would be taken to the upper room. Everybody's being entertained royally. Food is magnificent, the event is elegant. Then it comes time for the main purpose of the gathering. It's time to introduce the newborn babe to the high social order. But where was the baby? No one could find the child. In fact, the, the governess ran upstairs and returned with a desperate look on her face. She didn't see the baby. One of the guests remembered said, well, I saw the baby and when I came in, the baby was in, in, in there on a bed. I was one of the first people here and the baby was on a bed. I, I laid my wrap on that bed. The baby was on the bed all right buried beneath a pile of coats and jackets and furs and wraps. The baby whom this whole occasion was about, whom the whole celebration was about, had been forgotten, neglected, and nearly smothered. Christmas is easily hidden beneath a pile of tradition and cultural observances and things that we do of the season. But we need to enter this season we need to enter Christmas with the same question that came across the lips of the, of the wise men and the shepherds when they entered that place and said, where's the baby? Where's the baby? Let's keep him forefront. Let's keep him at the center of all things because the baby is the Lord of glory and the baby is the one who saves us and sets us free and the baby is the one who's coming back and that baby will not just be a baby anymore. He'll be a full-grown man sitting on the throne of David, the God-man, the man-God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and the nations will come and bow down before him. Amen. That day is coming. Hallelujah and praise the Lord. I want us to stand with our heads bowed.